Tengukur, welcome to In Conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Some of the scenarios that you've been researching look quite frightening. One of them, uh, which you call the Great Accelerator Downwards, or if I would call it possibly the worst case scenario, <laughs> really looks at a world that's completely falling apart. Now, how likely, though, is this kind of really bad post-COVID world? All of the scenarios that we write, whether in this publication or in other publications that myself, my, my colleagues at the Atlantic Council produce, are, are designed to be plausible, uh, which does not necessarily mean probable, but plausible. The reason why uh, any of these um, scenarios could occur in the future is because the drivers of change, um, many of which are baked into the into the system. A large number of them, however, are not actually baked in. They're, they're based on, on decisions that we make. In other words, human agency. So the one you're referring to, which is, the, which is the, essentially the deglobalization scenario, is one where in the United States, the, the three great uh, centers of the global economy, which are in North America, the United States, uh, which is the Asia Pacific, uh, is dominated by China, the Chinese economy, and, and Europe. Uh, do not recover swiftly, and moreover, do not cooperate well when it comes to a whole host of, of items, uh, economic exchange being one of them, uh, and only one of them, on security issues, diplomatic issues more broadly construed, and on, on managing the pandemic. And that that one then um, results in a world, a post-pandemic world, whether we're talking about 2021, 2022, and, and beyond, that is actually pretty, uh, pretty discouraging, as I think you, you rightly uh, describe it. Uh, wherein you, you don't have cooperation at, at global level, you don't have cooperation, uh, robust cooperation at bilateral level, and where you get uh, heightened suspicion, heightened mistrust, even amongst friends and allies around the world, uh, and you get uh, much poor economic outcomes for all of those regions, and it must be said for the global south as well. One of the things you point out with this worst case scenario is that all these countries stop talking to each other, all the summits, be it G20, United Nations, um, all of them seem to fracture and disintegrate. Yeah, I mean, we don't forecast that the, these multilateral institutions, uh, such as the G7, the G20, the, the various UN institutions, and, and many more beyond, uh, disappear uh, by all means, nor, nor that uh, the diplomats in the world stop talking to one another. The question is, is, what is the willingness to cooperate within these structures? Frankly, my expectation, even in the worst case scenario, would be that the Europeans would be willing to um, engage, uh, be most willing to engage on a multilateral front than would, would the US and China in this, in this scenario. We're not, we're not saying that that would simply stop talking. It's more a question of willingness to engage. And that's really where the rub is with where the, where the world is right now, with, uh, with the US-China bilateral relationship and with other strains within that system. You're absolutely correct to point out that we, we've had these uh, problems before the pandemic, even before the Trump administration, right? Growing, growing discord, for example, within the context of the US-China relationship, which is, is really the big set of questions we think going forward in terms of whether or not the world can be managed harmoniously. Let's look though at um, the Trump-Biden difference. Would one or the other make a significant difference uh, after the November uh, elections? Well, that's an outstanding question. Uh, my expectation would be that if, if uh, former Vice President Biden were to win, that uh, U.S. foreign policy would, be, would uh, revert more closely to where it has been for decades uh, compared with the Trump administration. Um, and, in other words, more consistent with, uh, with what I just described, right, which is an American commitment to um, multilateralism, which is an American commitment to the United States being perceived as a leader in, a, in, in the world in a positive sense, along with its allies and partners, uh, including in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so I do expect there, there would be a difference uh, between the, the two administrations, perhaps even a stark difference. This president has been, uh, you know, has been uh, a pretty um, broken a lot of norms, let's put it that way, with the way in which he speaks about, um, about not just uh, America's, um, how should we describe China, maybe a rival might be the best way to describe China at this point, um, not just with, say, China or any other country that maybe is not, um, is not considered a, one or one of uh, an ally or partner, but even describing the uh, alliances and the allies and, and, and the way in which the president talks about them. But won't President Trump 
dial back on this anti-China rhetoric after the election, if, let's say, he comes in again? Well, with President Trump, you never really know. Uh, he's proven to be, uh, you know, he's proven to, to uh, you know, say a lot of things and do a lot of things that are surprising. So, um, it, you know, it's a bit of a parlor game in, in Washington and elsewhere around the world trying to, to determine what this administration is going to do next. There's a longstanding tradition of, 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 of um, saying t uh, some tough rhetoric about China uh, leading up to a U.S. presidential election. And then after the election that, uh, you know, there's a reversion to the mean. So with this administration, for example, although I, do not, I would not anticipate the Trump administration all of a sudden uh, reverting to what uh, the Obama administration was doing vis-a-vis -vis its bilateral relations with China, uh, at the same time, there is some prospect that they will not um, continue to escalate the rhetoric uh, and therefore the policy questions involving China. Um, I also would hope and expect that the administration would be more willing to embrace its allies and partners in the Asia Pacific in particular. Doesn't it feel, though, for Japan as well as South Korea, who are traditionally allies of the U.S., that they are being left out hung to dry to some degree under the Trump administration? The risk for the Japans, the Koreas, uh, uh, the Singapores of, of the Asia Pacific are the, you know, being caught between these two giants and being forced to go in, in one direction or another. And there's real risk there as, if, as the U.S.-China bilateral relationship erodes, real risk there, that one of the things that will happen is that America's historic allies will begin to peel off and, and become closer to China, even up to and including becoming uh, clo very close to, their, to the Chinese uh, orbit. And so there's real risk that if the U.S. doesn't maintain those alliances and, and, and listen to what um, their allies and partners in the region want, and what they need from the United States on not just this hard security grounds, but also economic grounds and other kinds of, of areas that uh, there's real risk of, of some backsliding in those relationships. I mean, if we take, for example, something like the IMF, um, mm -hmm. it's an institution that has been dominated by the Europeans and by America, and where you could argue that both the IMF and World Bank, there's been a certain dissatisfaction, particularly from developing countries uh, and definitely from China, and they have gone and backed the AIIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Yeah, I mean, so this speaks to the question of, of how would one go about reforming this, this um, post-war order that the United States and its allies and partners constructed, really, in the decades after the Second World War, reforming because uh, the, the underlying power dynamics in the, in the world are, are, have changed and are changing. And, and the most obvious expression of that is, is the rise of China. So then that begs the question, well, if you want to maintain this rules-based international order, sometimes called the liberal international order after the um, Second World War, how do you go about adapting it so that it's more robust going forward and that it incorporates these, these actors who believe that they deserve a, uh, more of a, a say in and, and, and the way in which these multilateral institutions are, are, are run? I should say that when it comes to institutions that China has established, like the AIIB, and other, other multilateral institutions, which is in a way a form of creating a parallel uh, multilateral governance system, if you will. Um, I tend to agree with those who, who make the observation that it's one thing to create these institutions, which reinforces a narrative that, that China is rising and, and the old sort of world led by the United States is, is, is in relative decline. And that's a, important, I think, rhetorically for the Chinese, but it's, also, it's actually very, very difficult to create uh, a, par a truly parallel system of multilateral institutions that rivals in scale, size, and legitimacy, and funding, frankly. In terms of multilateral structures, 
uh, the Chinese have devoted a lot of, of, um, of, uh, of their effort to um, working within those structures to increase their weight uh, within, for example, the UN system. And I think that's where a lot of their effort has gone because they understand that, that these institutions are going to be the, the, the biggest institutions for the foreseeable future. Let's move on to your China first scenario. We can see that innovations with technology aren't just taking place in the US anymore. In fact, so much so that uh, the United States is becoming incredibly protective uh, about it. In fact, forcing something like TikTok to relinquish its, uh, uh, its holdings in the US without actually having to show that they have been illegally keeping data or tracking American citizens, or for that matter, other citizens. Right, exactly. I mean, I think this is the, this, uh, this question about technological governance uh, and technological competition is, is it reflects this sea change in the bilateral relationship between US and China. And so if you look back 30 years to the 1990s, uh, when you know globalization was the uh, you know was going to end history, so to speak, that the United States was very much willing to engage in, in an open exchange on, on the technological side in terms of innovating around technology, uh, in terms of sharing the benefits that come from from uh, research as well as uh, the production of, of technologies, uh, and consider that to be a good. And and now that that narrative is is changing because of the relationship between on the one hand technology and economic growth and economic development. Uh, on the other hand, between uh, technology and hard security questions, in other words, for military use, right? And so as this two sides have increasingly adopted a narrative of, of mistrust and suspicion towards one another, inevitably a lot of these other areas are brought in, including the technological space, wherein uh, there is a, a maybe it's accurate to say a rising perception here in Washington that China has abused technologies in strategic terms, and therefore the U.S. needs to, to respond somehow in some way. Whether or not that's, that's um, the wisest course of action is to do what the Trump administration has done with respect to TikTok or Huawei is a totally different question. But I think viewing technology in strategic terms is, um, is, is now front and center in, in, in the debate between the two countries and, and, and how the U.S. foreign policy establishment sees sees that equation. But isn't it a bit peculiar? Because it then means that all companies are viewed merely as an extension of government. We just see them as no more than part of, you know, Microsoft is no more than part of the security infrastructure of the American defense. Or we see, you know, TikTok yeah. is no more than an extension of uh, Chinese uh, spying capabilities. I don't think there's an easy answer to this dilemma, frankly, uh, which is that, yes, if you, if, if, um, especially in the technological space, um, that firms are, be, are seen as sort of uh, either instruments on the one hand or pawns on the other of, of, of states, in particular the largest states around the world, and that are part of a chess game, a, a geopolitical chess game. But the flip side of that narrative is what about the consumer rights and citizen rights, correct? Around questions of privacy, around questions of transparency, around questions of, of health. And this is a debate that I'm afraid is not going to go away. It's going to become more difficult if the trends continue wherein uh, at least some aspects of the global economy are perceived primarily uh, through a geopolitical lens. That, that dilemma of balancing those things is going to become much more pressing um, down the road. about your final scenario, which you can call the most optimistic scenario, and that is everybody moves back towards cooperation. We have much more trade. Um, the only thing about that scenario that troubled me was, is that a fairly US-based scenario in which it's biased towards us returning to a state in which the United States is the hegemon, in which the rest of the world merely accepts 
um, a world framed by what the EU, United States considers to be good and beneficial, um, which sometimes, of course, can be seen as protecting really just American rights, not necessarily the rights of all the other countries or their development goals. Your question to, speaks to what is the, what is the legitimacy of, of this world that we inhabit? Um, and what is, the, what is the value of the world that we inhabit? And, and we in, in the States and in the sort of foreign affairs community like to make this claim, and we think it's a good one, that after World War II, the US did in fact lead, and that doesn't mean it did it alone, but it led in, in cooperation with uh, many actors around the world to build a world wherein we could uh, do a couple of things. One is to increase prosperity for not everyone, not everyone has enjoy, enjoyed that rising prosperity equally, to institute certain norms of multilateralism into the world, and also by extension to prevent a great power conflict. And that's, that's held, Both, all those things have held over the past 70 years. And that's the great virtue of maintaining and reinvigorating a world that, that follows those basic norms and principles um, admittedly needing to be adapted to the new power realities in the world, which is really the hard part of that equation. But, um, but I think that that's a reasonable hypothesis to put forward, and it, it does benefit the United States, but, but our argument is that it, it has and, and will continue to benefit other parties in the world. I would argue that that framing doesn't always do justice to the rest of the world. It becomes a U.S. bias. That kind of framing takes away all the efforts that have been made by local people themselves to pull themselves out of poverty, the tremendous efforts made in China, the tremendous efforts made in India and Indonesia. And it denies the fact that I'm afraid the United States didn't always influence for the good. No, I mean, look, I, 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 I'm not going to defend every foreign policy decision that the United States made uh, you know, since 1945. Um, and, and of course, we don't mean to detract from the agency that, that local peoples around the world have. Um, in, in uh, doing all kinds of things, not just on an economic front, but socially, politically, and otherwise, to improve not only their lives, but, but the lives of others. Um, and so I, I appreciate the, the, the argument. Um, it's just that we, we argue that, uh, that the, the basic principles of the world since 1945, the basic principles, the norms that are embedded in it are worth keeping. And that if we, do, if we abandon those, you return to a pre-World War II or pre-World War I world. And that world, is, as, as, as was demonstrated by two world wars that killed many, 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 many millions of human beings, those worlds were less stable uh, and you know, far more dangerous. Um, and, and so uh, you know, we argue that um, strengthening uh, making, strengthening the current uh, system, making it more inclusive, uh, in, in not just for rising powers, again, like China or India, but also for the, in terms of the global South and more responsive to their needs is the solution going forward. And if we don't have a solution like that, we're gonna have a world that be basically begins to fray and we don't know what comes after that. That's the risk. What comes after that? Do we return to a world that is characterized by great power competition up to and including the possibility of great power conflict. And we know with the military capabilities that the world's leading, uh, world's leading states possess today that that will not be pretty if it ever occurs, and let's hope it does not. Let's look at the likelihood of each of the scenarios. So if we take the worst case scenario, on one hand, deglobalization, people stop talking to each other, um, it becomes very fractious. Uh, the middle bit, which seems to be a kind of China first, China ascends, but it's there with great frictions. And then the final one being happy days. We, we managed to realize that through this pandemic that we're really all one world. What's the likelihood yeah. of each of the scenarios? We were not in the prediction business. This question makes me very, very nervous. So let me caveat that first. But um, I would say that the, the most likely would be the China first scenario. I mean, it appears as if right now the asymmetric recovery is happening. Uh, the big question there will be, what are the knock-on effects of that? Right? Will, it, will it result in systemic change or will it result in, you know, in something which is more temporary and that um, post-asymmetric world you get into actually a scenario that we don't describe here? But if I had to choose between the three right now, I'd say that one is the most likely. On that cautiously optimistic note, Peter Engerke, thank yeah, you well. very much for being on In Conversation. Well, thank you very much for having me. It was really delightful to, uh, to, uh, to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much.